All throughout the Bible, there's a prevailing theme. Each person is responsible for what God has given to them. Time, talent, and treasure, we are called to be stewards. We all have lots of stuff that we call ours, our homes, our cars, our careers, our athletic ability, our musical ability, but the truth is none of it belongs to us. Everything we have belongs to God. Thankfully, Jesus took time in his epic Sermon on the Mount to address how we should live as disciples with our resources. What's up, Man of Church? I wanna say a welcome to each and every one of you. I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Each and every one of you right here in this room with me, but we have some folks joining us on the other end of that camera. Whether you're right here at Cliffdale or at any one of our sites here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region, maybe you're at a microsite, wherever you are all across the military highway, can we make them feel welcome? It's good. Today on Veterans Day weekend, I, I thought it appropriate that we have a guest who's really more than a guest. Pastor Jim LaFoon is, is a, a veteran. He served, but he, he uh, was best man in my dad's wedding. He cut his teeth in ministry here at Manor Church from a very early age, but what's happened in Pastor Jim's life from then on has been amazing. I've known him my entire life. He really is a prophet of prophets. He prophesies to... Uh, so many churches all across the nation and across the world, but he always takes time out of his schedule to come here and to invest in us here at Mana Church. So really when I say we have a guest this morning, we really have more than a guest. We have a member of the family, Pastor Jim LaFoon. So I wonder if you would please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Pastor Jim LaFoon. We give God a clap offering today too. Just worthy of all our praise. I first came to Fayetteville in 1972 to serve in the 82nd Airborne Division and found the Man of Church shortly thereafter. So I've been around a long time. When I came to the Man of Church, there were 50 people, believe it or not. And it's so good to see Marshall and Wendy Bowen. I've known them since I was a kid. Um, there's Jody over there back, known her for ages. Joe Rodriguez, who's now, I guess, maybe 89. Can't believe it. I've known him since I was a young man. You go, well, how old are you, like 40? Yes, give or take, that's true. I'm 69. All righty. Well, I'm just honored to be here. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful to be with my man of family. See, like just yesterday, I got off a bus in Fayetteville. They told me I was going to the sandy beaches. There was a lot of sand for sure. But here I am, and I've been here every year. So honored to be here. I ask your blessing, Lord, on this church, both, Lord, those here and those deployed. Thank you for the military highway, of what they're doing. God, you've always had soldiers at the heart of your plan to change the world. We thank you for it. Amen. <clears throat> Before I get into our stewardship message, Pastor Chris has asked me to comment a bit on the world from time to time by the way I'm wired. I see world events that are coming and I have for a good long time now. So I wanna comment on where we are in the world, um, what's happening. And I wanna tell you, nothing takes God by surprise. So I'm gonna take about five minutes and kind of brush through the world and then I'll go right into stewardship. When, I, when you begin to look at COVID and all the things that have gone on, Probably my first glance at all that would have been the last day of 2018. I attend a, a multi-ethnic, multi-site church in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is part of Nashville. Um, I'm rarely there, maybe once a month, and I serve on the board there and an elder there I have for many years. Um, and I always speak on New Year's to give a little happy New Year's service word. This would be the unhappy New Year's. I was sitting on the front row and the Lord began to speak to me and reveal things to me. And I saw a terrible, terrible shaking coming to our country. I saw New York crushed. I saw the West Coast stand on end. People began to leave, scared to death. I could just feel panic everywhere. Who'll save us? What's gonna happen to us? And I realized, okay, minimally, our country's getting to walk into a terrifying crisis. 
and I kept hearing the words 17 months, 17 months, 17 months. And I saw the Lord reach out and catch the country. And as I was seeing the rest of that, our pastor there, um, he's, he's an African-American and he said, I now introduce our board member for a happy new year's. Anyway, that was the famous last words. And I got up and began to speak about what was gonna come on the country. I said in 17 months from when I was standing there today, there would come another time of God dealing with America's ethnic pain. Of course, 17 months later, Mr. Floyd was killed in Minneapolis and went on to tell the church and my, the, the side I'm in is probably 60, 70% African-American. I said, brothers, sisters, listen, God's gonna use our church. We're coming to a time of terrifying ethnic tension in the country. I said, I'm here to tell you in 17 months this will begin, but you're not to be afraid. The country's gonna become so brutally polarized that many will think we're gonna end up in anarchy. In the end, we're gonna end up in an outpouring of God's spirit and revival's going to come. And that was kind of my first glance. And by May 18 and 19 of 2019, um, I'd already met with key leaders from across the country in January to take a look at what I thought would happen. So these things were like on tape and this and that. And, and I was in May 18th and 19th, I was kind of really went into the mountains to pray for 10 days of Tennessee. Um, on the 18th, God said, listen, your country is going to get really dangerous, Jim. I'm telling you now, danger is coming to your country. I thought, well, is a deer hunter going to shoot me in Tennessee? Like, what do you mean? And he said, let me tell you, he said, you better draw close to me. The world's coming into a terrible place. The next morning I woke up in prayer and God said, this is, this is what's coming. And I saw coming out of China, a mindless, um, murderous, river of death, and I wrote in my journal, to every nation it'll go killing and bringing woe. And I, and I knew that somehow it was man created, and I didn't know what it meant. I knew later, of course, it was COVID, and ended up in part of a prayer movement that really hundreds of millions of people prayed in 191 countries. But during all this time, I never lost sight of the fact that what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. And in 2020, I'll never forget sitting there you know, no one was traveling much to say the least. And the world was just seemingly broken. And I don't normally share these stories, but I'm gonna share this one I didn't in the first service. Um, it was one of those lulls in COVID where people thought they could travel again. And I think it was 2020, 20, I can't remember, it was 2020, who knows. And I was in the, um, I was in the men's bathroom in Atlanta, my home away from home, I've flown millions of miles. And I was reaching down to the sink and I saw one of the biggest human hands I've ever seen. Happened to be an African-American hand, more like a grizzly bear paw. I was reaching for a towel, he was reaching. I felt, I'd definitely give the towel to him. He goes, that's your towel, brother. And I looked up and he was six foot, six, seven, six, six, a giant. I go, yes, sir, that's my towel. And we walked out of the bathroom and I could sense the Holy Spirit on me, could on me. This is God be my witness. He pointed down. He looked down at me. Stop acting surprised. You know everything God told you was gonna happen in the country and happen in the world. You're not to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Revival's coming. Revival's coming. God's gonna use this. Then he said, I'm off to Iraq. Goodbye. Goodbye. The, the giant disappeared in the crowd. Now you used to tell me, was that a prophet? Was that an angel? I don't know, but it was God anyway. And so during all these periods of time, I was strengthened. As we came in October of 2021, the Lord had told me when we hit that May that in 17 months we were halfway done. And so we began to come toward October of 2021, begin to have the sense that COVID is going to come to an end. It's going to go from pandemic to endemic, which it began to do in November and as I was on the phone with our, some of our leaders in Ukraine in 2021, and they go, Pastor Jim, we're a little worried what's gonna happen. And the Holy Spirit came on me and I said this, Russia's gonna come and invade you, country. They're gonna make a land grab. But I'm telling you not, don't be afraid. The paw of the bear will be slapped. In fact, the Lion of Judah is greater than the bear. And I've been all through Russia, love Russia, worked with 2,000 Russian churches. This is not political. And so, but God's never taken by surprise and we come into a, uh, um, 2022 and, you know, sitting there in, in, in January, I began to sense 
all around Eastern Europe was gonna erupt. And in February, I'm sitting in my office in front of my world map in prayer and the Lord says, by the way, next week, Russia's gonna invade the Ukraine. And he said, all the world's gonna be afraid, but you're not. I said, why is that? He said, this will be their next Afghanistan. Um, it won't go well for them in the Ukraine. And he said, in fact, I'll, I'll raise up the Ukrainian people before I'm done as a mighty evangelistic force. No one would have believed that then, including my well-placed friends, but all that to say, God's not surprised. At the end of, and at the end of 2021, I forgot that, I was just in prayer and I saw an acceleration coming to the church for 36 months, which would end the, the day of the next presidential election. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is beginning to move, beginning to move on us. Trust me, I'll define that in a moment. June, 2022, I had a real sense that the world was coming to an inflection point. It wasn't business as usual. The Lord met me in prayer and he said, the drops of revival will begin to fall in the world. Jim, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. It's, it's gonna get bad, it's gonna get dark. People are gonna be afraid, but I'm gonna move. I'm gonna use it. I was in prayer in Birmingham, Alabama in August 24th, 2023. I was taken in prayer and I could just see the UK. No one knew the queen was sick. Everyone in the UK was weeping, crying. The Union Jack was at half mask. I thought, my goodness, what has died? And Jesus stepped out in the screen of my imagination grabbed the lanyard of the flag on the mast, pulled the Union Jack back up. He said, don't be afraid. My glory is gonna come. My spirit's gonna be poured out. You watch what I do. I'll open the ancient wells, the revival all over the world. And the next week he said, when the queen of England dies, you will know that my spirit is coming to the earth. I'm gonna move. Don't be afraid. February 3rd, sitting in front of my world map of this year, the Lord said, Jim, the first drops of my spirit have begun to fall but literal thunderstorms of my spirit are coming to America. I'm gonna bathe America in the world in my power. Some of you may have heard about this little thing that happened in Asbury, two stoplights, Asbury College Seminary. Few students had chapel, terrible chapel, they say, but for 17 more days, they never went home. Students dragged their beds in, 70,000 people showed up. Stark auditorium, not cool like this one. God came million, a hundred million hits on TikTok. Why? God just showed up, spread to many other universities. Now, let me say this. That was February 8th. Let me say this. We're in a unique moment that God has come to help us. January 1st of this year is the last thing I'll share with you prophetically. I'd had sinus surgery where I couldn't come to my, aunt, my normal visit last year in December. So I was sleeping in my recliner and I kind of came to at 1.45 in the morning on the first day of this year, the Lord said, come in, go, to, get out, go outside, go to your office, which is connected to the garage. And I went out and sat down. And God said, welcome to a turning point year. He said, Jim, this year, sabers are gonna rattle. The winds of war are gonna blow ferociously. The whole world is gonna be afraid. They're gonna fear even nuclear war. But I'm gonna intervene and I'm gonna save the world. What the enemy means for evil, I mean for good. Don't be afraid of it. And here we stand today. Nothing takes God by surprise. Next year, yes, it's gonna be hard in many ways. I won't go into that, except to say this. God's spirit is gonna blow very uniquely, Pastor Chris, on the man of church. And before your midway of next year, there will be a surge that you will not be able to account for. It'll come in growth. It'll come in numbers. There'll be a, a new site that seemingly comes out of nowhere with a group calling for it. How many of you know nothing's too difficult for God? How many of you know nothing surprises God? We don't need to fear like the world fears. Now, let me get to stewardship. Okay, I'm, I'm asked to speak on stewardship. I'm gonna entitle this vision correction because how you give is based on very simply how you see. You've been in the passage of Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19, talking about how you store your treasures, store them in heaven, not on the earth, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then it has an interesting thing, and it stops, says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. 
But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Why pause and talk about how you see? It's very simply this. How you see determines every area of your life. Your level of stewardship is directly related to how you see the world, how you see reality, how you see time, how you see your life. Now I'm gonna basically divide this little message into three quick parts. I wanna talk about the power of stewardship, the problem with our stewardship, and the process of correcting our vision. When you look at transformational stewardship, it is at the very heart of God's plan to change the world. In fact, there are two things behind the scenes that empower the transformation of the world. Prayer and stewardship, I'll prove that to you. When God got ready to reach the Gentile world, he made two forays. Jesus made one, the first brought a great touch, but not transformation, the second under Peter. Both of these forays had two things in common. A Roman centurion was at the heart of God's plan to change the Gentile world. And secondly, both men were givers. Watch this story. It's Luke seven. Jesus is coming into Capernaum this was his headquarters after being rejected at Nazareth. And within the next day or so, they're gonna be on the way to the Decapolis, 10 cities on the other side of Galilee, Romanized under Pompeii 90 to 100 years before. And he comes into Capernaum in Luke 7, we won't read it all to save time. And much to his amazement, a group of Pharisees approach him. They said, by the way, there's the Roman centurion here. Now, Pharisee didn't have much to do with Roman centurions. Now, was he retired? Now, working for Herod? Was he an auxiliary? It's not like a normal legion, hard to say. At the time, there did not seem to be a legion stationed in Galilee, but we don't really know. He said, listen, his servant is dying. You need, Jesus said, now, why are Pharisees wanting me to help a Roman centurion? They say, he built our synagogue. This man built our church. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to his house right now. Two things happen, one good, one bad. The good thing was the centurion said, listen, just speak the word, my servant's healed. But whatever you do, don't come into my house. I'm unworthy. He settled for a healing. He could have had a house call. Why would that have been important? Because if Jesus would have come into his house, he would have launched his first foray into the Gentile world, not out of Peter's house, out of a centurion's house. Interesting, isn't it? A few years later, as we find from Acts 15, Peter's telling the story of how he reached the Gentiles. He's being questioned how, like, how could you baptize these Gentiles Haggad, he said, well, let me tell this story. I was in prayer one day, and I was in Joppa, and it's interesting, the city where Jonah ran from his call to reach the Gentiles in Nineveh, Peter said yes. Interesting, isn't it? And there he is in Joppa, and he said, man, I was in prayer, and I had this sheet full of all these unclean things. You and I would have loved them. Who knows? fried shrimp, pork chops, spare ribs. The Lord said, take eat. I just said, it's about time. He said, I won't do it. And God said, listen, don't call unclean what I call clean. In fact, there's a man coming to your door. When he knocks, go with him. Goes down, there's a knock at the door. And here is probably the servant of the Roman centurion, possibly a soldier we don't know. He said, I serve a Roman centurion. This is real live, one of the legions, not exactly Peter's favorite people. And he says this, here's why I'm here. My centurion had a visitation from the Lord. And the Lord told him, Cornelius, 
You're giving, interesting, your alms, your giving and your prayers have created a memorial. They've created a legacy in heaven. And because of your faith that I've seen evidence in your giving and your prayer, I've chosen you. There's a man named Peter, go and get him. Peter's shocked. He says, well, I'm gonna, it's gotta be God, I'm gonna go. And he walks into the Roman centurion, all his friends, yes, probably soldiers. Roman centurions, as you know, were at the very backbone of the Roman army. The highest casualty rates every year were among centurions. First in the fight. The rest is history. The spirit of God falls and you and I are here today. Giving has the power, like prayer, to alter destinies. That being true, let's cut to the root of what determines our gifting. Apart from Christ, apart from being born again, our vision is radically impaired by the darkness of the world system and the fact that we are all born blind. You came into the world because of your sin nature, separated from God and blind to the reality of his kingdom. Blind to the reality of the world and the way he sees it. He told Nicodemus, the great teacher of the law, he'd been talking to Nicodemus about being born again and Nicodemus, this great, brilliant teacher, said, well, I need to crawl back at my mom. What do you mean? He said, Nicodemus, unless you've got a new birth, you can't even see my kingdom. You can't even see what I'm talking about. Unless something radical, you're going to live blind. Speaking to Christians in Revelation 3, 17 and 18, he says, you say I'm rich. You say I've prospered. You say I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. You better buy gold refined in the fire that you can become rich, white garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And by the way, get some salve to anoint your eyes so you can see. Even though you're saved, you've got an eye problem. You're not seeing the world right. You say you're rich and you're prosperous and you've got your promotion. I say you're poor. Says all this in the world system is the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes and the pride of life that is run by the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride. Jesus talks about eyes pretty seriously in Matthew 18, 9. If your eye causes you to sin, if your lack of seeing biblically causes you to sin, cut your eye out and throw it away. That's fairly radical surgery. It is better for you to enter life one-eyed than burn in hell with two. How you see is important. Is there any hope for Christ to correct our vision? Is there any hope that in this life we can see the world the way he sees it, because in the reality, how you see affects not just your stewardship, but every area of your life. How about eye salve and eye drops? When our eyes cause us to sin through lusting for possessions, porn, whatever it might be, we can apply the eye drops of God's word to stimulate correction and conviction. But the fact of it is the normal things we see like well, these porn or possessions, that's the fruit, not the root. The real issue is we need new lenses. We need a lens transplant. God needs to correct our vision. We have a new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson. This is not political. He's De definitely, whether you like his politics or not, a deep Christian. I know the man that's discipled him for decades. And they recently asked him, and it stunned him. They go, well, how do you see the various issues of the world? Gave an answer that's still ricocheting around the press. Well, pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it, he said. 
That's my worldview. How I many that's a fairly radical statement? Not a, not, I've never heard a politician say it, and I might add, he lives it. At least best we know, who can tell? But the fact of it is, what did he mean? What he meant is, is I've corrected my vision, my corrective lenses are the Bible. That I see the world through the lens of the Bible. I see the world through the lens of God's kingdom. Like, if God was to fully correct your vision, what would be different? If God was to correct your vision, three things would change radically. Your concept of truth, reality, and time. And when those three things change, it changes everything. See, when the, according to the Bible, truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. There's no such thing as what's true for me is not true for you. No. The Bible is very absolute. This is righteous. This is unrighteous. This is sin. This is not. And when you begin to see the world through the lens of the Bible, you realize I live by what God says. That the Bible is my authority, not my whim, not my want. But secondly, your view of reality changes. The average secular human has a really a one-dimensional view of the world. What you see or what you can prove through the scientific method is what there is. This is all there is. There's nothing else when I die. That is not the view of the Bible. The Bible sees the world three-dimensionally. Yes, there's the empirical world. Yes, there's the world you see and you can prove, but there's also an invisible world where the Holy Spirit works, where there are angels, where there are demons. There's a very invisible world. The enemy's called the prince and power of the air. There's demonic use. That's weird. That's just the Bible. But there's also the fact that there's an eternal world. We are not finite. When we die, we will either spend all of our eternity with God or apart from him. Let me give you an example of how this shapes you. Let me talk about the second dimension. Things I just told you came to me because there really is a world where God's alive and active in our world. You just can't see him. I'll never forget one of my sons in the Lord was off to Afghanistan to lead a fire base, a very dangerous one. And I'd homeschooled him, helped raise him. He said, Uncle Jim, he said, you know, I'm going to Afghanistan. Will you pray for him? I've been praying for him since he was born. And in one of my prayer times or during the day, it would have been night then. I can't remember the time difference. I saw him leading a patrol off this fire base and it was pitch black. And as he was stepping down, I saw an IED, like the trigger to it, whatever, some kind of mine IED, I just saw it. And God goes, he's in danger. I prayed, I cried out. It's like I shoved him. Came back home and he said, Uncle Jim, I appreciate you praying for me. One night I was on patrol and as I was stepping down, something froze me and I looked down and saw if I would have stepped down, I'd have died and so would my men. Reality is not just what you see. It's not just what you prove. So when you get new lenses, you see the world completely differently. But how does this happen? Now the Bible says this, his word in Hebrews 4.12 is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces, it cuts, it divides. When my wife got new lenses, she had cataracts, decided to get new lenses at 67 and correct her vision. One of the foremost laser surgeons in the world is part of our church, probably the most famous and he cut into her eyes, and I tell you, the word of God, the Bible says this, the unfolding of your word gives light. And as you begin to interact with the word, hearing it in preaching, reading it, feeding on it, heeding it, obeying it, the very light 
of the word of God begins to change how you see. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the spirit of the man or woman is the lamp of the Lord. You really have two lamps, the lamp of your eyes and the lamp of your spiritual eyes, your spirit. And as the cutting word of God goes into your world, year after year, you're living in the word, hearing the word preached, fellowshipping around the word. Their lenses begin to change. You begin to see all reality different. Once that begins to take place, you need therapy. And the verse that defines my therapy is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight. What does that mean? In the end, I will live my life by what God says, not by what I see. I don't deny reality. I simply realize there is a greater reality. I'll never forget being a young man living here in North Carolina. I was in Rocky Mount, involved in one of the first church plants ever in the history of manna. I was pastoring there and my wife um, got thyroid cancer. We didn't have great medicine there. Sorry, Rocky Mount. And they made a lot of mistakes and we waited too long and now she's got cancer. We go up to Raleigh and um, they're radiating her. That was kind of the wild days of radiation. Didn't quite know what they're doing. Gave her a stroke. She had a stroke in the hospital. I had four small children. She couldn't recognize his talk. She finally snapped out of it. And the doctor who hadn't been hired for his bedside manner says, we believe there's really brain cancer. We're sorry to say, go home and enjoy your children. That was smart, wasn't it? And I'm driving home. But I fundamentally believe that the doctor's word is not the last word. I believe in medicine, use medicine, believe in hospitals. But the last word in my life is not the word of the doctor, it's the word of God, or I'd be, be dead from the hepatitis I contracted in the jungles. What is the last word? I'm, I'm going back, I'm scared to death, I got four small kids. And all of a sudden the peace of God begins to rise up in me. It suffocates the anxiety. And I hear this voice, I believe to be the voice of God. Stop praying. I go, I rebuke you, devil. The Bible says pray when someone's sick. God said, ain't the devil you're rebuking, it's me. I said, well, why should I stop praying? He said, waste of your time. I said, that's scary. She's fine. So I prayed for world missions. The doctor said, well, she's fine. Whether she never had it or got healed, who cares? But I will, in the end, walk by faith, not by sight. I never deny reality, I face reality, but I always realize, I see the world where there's something more powerful than human power. Now, if God was to give you a new lens, if God was to correct your vision, how might you see stewardship? My suggest it would change you in five different ways. Number one, as it says in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, you'd realize the safest place for my treasures is heaven. The safest place I can put my money. You know, I grew up with nothing. My dad worked three jobs to support us. We went to McDonald's once a month. They had two pairs of pants. Couldn't have, they, they loved God. We pastored in a terrified, tough, tough gang area. No regrets. But I did not grow up with a silver spoon. It's not like my parents put away for college. My dad, my dad gave me a handshake. Been good to raise you. If you want to pay your own way to college, you can live here free. Like I grew up with different parents. You know, as thank God for them, but I didn't grow up with it. But I did grow up with givers. Mom and dad were tremendous givers. And I began to realize the safest place for my money is that money I sow in the kingdom. I began to realize that God promises to supply all my needs, not my wants. He does supply my needs. He does take care of me. I began to realize that I could live on God's economy. And that's described in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one of you must give what he's decided to give. Don't be reluctant, don't be manipulated. God loves a cheerful giver. God can make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you can abound in every good work as it's written. He's distributed freely. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. 
He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way. Why? To be generous in every way. I began to realize that God has his own economy. It's called sowing and reaping. I have never ever in my life given to get, but I've never ceased to get when I give. Kevin, I minimally are 20% givers for decades now. I don't regret it. I'll never forget when a great apostle came to my church when I was pastoring. I said, preach on stewardship. It was the worst decision of my life. He got up, he said, well, Brother Jim has asked me to preach on tithing, but I ain't tithed for years. I thought, oh man, you're messing up my church. He goes, 20 years ago, the Lord came to me. His name was Earl. He said, Earl? I said, yes, Lord. He said, how's that 10%? He goes, fine. Well, Lord, I've been, Lord said, I've been happy to give it. God goes, I've been loving it. Earl said, I love my 90%. He said, well, if you're so happy, let's trade. Earl said, what, Lord? Give me 90, keep 10. Earl said, I've been giving 90 ever since. I tried to shut him down. I said, okay, okay, go. Anyway, so much for that. What does it mean by that? Earl got in God's economy in a way I don't hope to get on it. But let me say this. Never the first time God really challenged me to give. I had 20,000 bucks in my RA. And that wasn't long ago. 20 years, maybe. 20,000 bucks. And my friend was building a building and the Holy Spirit came to me and said, break your IRA, give him 10,000 and pay a thousand dollar penalty. I go, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. My wife is really frugal. I know she'll say no. I said, honey, I think maybe the devil spoke to me. What'd he say? She goes, that's God and you know it. Break our IRA. He said, because you've obeyed me, I'll multiply that 10 times and give you a home. He did. Beloved, I've seen the economy of God work. We could talk about the stock market if you wanted, and I've got money in the stock market, but it's not my hope. It's not where my treasure is. God has an economy. And when he corrects your vision, he'll open your eyes to it. You begin to realize, according to Proverbs 19, 17, whenever we give to the poor and needy, we lend to the Lord. We give to the poor. We sow into what God's doing. We're lending to him and he's really great at paying things back. Philippians 4, 17, we find the greatest investment account we'll ever make is heavenly. Paul said, I don't need a gift from you, but I want you to have the opportunity to increase your heavenly credit. I've been given 20% a long time. My house to be fully paid off, all kinds of things but he's never ceased to give back. First inheritance check I got, I gave away. Why? God told me to. God told me to. I'll never forget me. Before COVID, I was preaching this big church. And a lot of, I've always lived a lot on our rams, at least half my, it's always coming from outside, whatever little salary I had. And, and don't feel sorry for me. He's a great provider. And um, I was preaching this big church that gave me this, they gave me a large honorarium. It's 10,000 bucks. The Lord said, give it all back to him. I said, well, Lord, I could really use it. He said, give it all back to him. I said, well, Lord, there's a big church. Give it all back to him. I gave it back to him. Never even heard a thank you. Nothing. Two years went by. They called me on the phone. They said, by the way, this is us. You were with us two years ago. We just want you to know we're taking care of you the whole time you're on COVID and can't travel. We live on God's economy. He cares for us. He'll take care of you. Pastor Christopher's joining me up here now. You're here this morning, you say, I could use some corrective surgery. I'm asking God to correct. If you say you want to begin to see the world more like the Lord sees it, raise your hand, I'll pray for you right now. Put them up, wave at me so I can see you. There we go. Holy Spirit, we submit to your corrective surgery. We want to see the world as you see it. We want to see the world. I'm praying for my beloved Manna family. Lord, we will say we are blind, now we see. Give us new lenses. Lord, let us see 
time, reality, and truth the way you see it. May we, like the centurions we've read about, impact the world through our stewardship. Pastor Chris. If you just keep your head bowed for one more moment, just for one more prayer, maybe for some of you the corrective surgery that Pastor Jim's referring to starts with seeing Jesus as you, should, as you should see Jesus. For some of you, you've not stepped through the gate of trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or maybe for some of you, you've been, you, you've been trying. You, you, you've you prayed a prayer once, you've been trying to do better, but your, your life is not bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Wherever you find yourself in the midst of that, if you go this morning, listen, the, the, my, my issue is that I need to, I, the, the correction that I need right now, right now in this moment, you're starting to feel uncomfortable, there's something going on, right now in this moment, I need to correct that, my relationship with Jesus. Either I need to trust him as Lord or I need to take his hand and walk with him. That With every head bowed and every eye closed, both here in this site and wherever you're joining us right now, I wanna ask you for a really simple action step. In a second, we're gonna pray a prayer together out loud. I promise you I'm not gonna embarrass you, but if that's you and you go, that's my issue, would you raise your hand and hold it up long enough for me and one of our team members to see it right now? Just raise your hand. Yep, I see your hand. Raise your hand, hold it up long enough for we, me or one of our team members to see it. They're gonna put a packet in your hand. They're moving to you right now. If I haven't seen you, look in the seat back pocket in front of you. The same packet they're gonna put in your hand is right there. Take the packet, fill the card out, leave it on your seat. You're not joining anything. It just gives our team a record of the decision that you've made and lets us resource you with some things to take your next steps in your journey with him. If that's you, just raise your hand, hold it up long enough for me or one of our team members to see it. Anybody else wanna jump in? All right, come on, church, repeat this after me from the bottom of our hearts like it's our first time. Say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Please come into my heart. Please forgive my sin. Please be the Lord of my life. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate with those who made that decision? this morning. God bless you. You can be dismissed. If you need prayer in any area of your life, we've got a team down front who would love to pray with you. Otherwise, God bless you. It's Rock Week. Hope to see you right back here Thursday night, 630 for the opening night of Rock. Have a great day. Bye for now.